Hey everybody, this is Sarah Quick. Let's discuss ventilator alarms. So when we all hear that noise, we are pretty convinced that the ventilator is really angry with us and that it's yelling at us. But it turns out that ventilators are really just very misunderstood. Ventilators are actually very nice. They're your friend. And when they're alarming, what they're actually doing is not yelling at you. What they're trying to do is just get your attention because they're basically saying, hello, I have something very important to tell you about your patient's lungs. Because you can learn so much more about your patient's lungs from a ventilator than you can from a chest x-ray or an ultrasound or even a chest CT. The ventilator gives you invaluable information about your patient's pulmonary physiology. And all you need to do is learn how to understand what the ventilator is telling you. Now, the first step to doing that is understanding the functional anatomy of a ventilator. So ventilators are kind of like cars. There's a bunch of different makes and models, but at the end of the day, you know, I can get in pretty much any car and figure out how to drive it because I'm like, okay, there's a steering wheel and I got to find the brakes and the gas. And it may take me a minute to be like, is that the, oh no, that's the windshield wipers. But, you know, at the end of the day, I know enough about how a car functional works to figure it out. Ventilators, the same thing. So no matter what make and model of a ventilator you have, it'll have some basic components. The three core ones are as follows. The first core component of a ventilator is the section where you tell the ventilator what you want to happen. The second core component of the ventilator is where the ventilator tells you what's actually happening. Because with ventilators, as in life, what you want to happen and what's actually happening, not always the same thing, unfortunately. And finally, there's the most important section of the ventilator, where the ventilator tells you why things are happening. Now, for optimal vent communication, we all need to get down to some basic pulmonary physiology. Fortunately, we're going to keep it really, really basic. Because all we're going to do is break down the lungs into two core components. One, our straws, and two, our balls. And, you know, fortunately, you already have a really intuitive understanding of pulmonary physiology. How do we know that? Well, ask yourself this question. What would you rather do? What would be easier? Would you rather blow up a beach ball with a boba straw? Or would you rather blow up a basketball with a coffee straw? Not a trick question. It would be easier to blow up your beach ball with your boba straw, right? Right. So now all we need to do is map that intuitive understanding onto terms of pulmonary physiology. The first term is resistance. Resistance refers to the pressure required to get the air to the ball. So resistance is telling you about the straws. How much pressure does it take to get the air through those straws to the ball? Compliance is the second term. The compliance is telling you about the ball part. The compliance tells you the pressure required to actually inflate the ball. Because those are the two things, resistance and compliance, that your friendly ventilator are really going to help you figure out about your patient's lungs. Now, fortunately, there's not an infinite number of vent alarms. There's a handful of them, but at the end of the day, only two of them really matter. And only two of them matter because they're the only two vent alarms that, one, indicate that something is very seriously wrong that you need to fix sooner rather than later, and two, these are also the two types of alarms that can tell you so much useful information about your patient's pulmonary physiology. So the two important vent alarms are, one, your low tidal volume alarm, and two, your high peak pressure alarm. So let's start with your low tidal volume alarm. That's when this guy, under the section of what's actually happening, is going to alarm. And it's going to tell you that the exhaled tidal volume, you know, the tidal volume the patient's actually getting, is too low. Now, when we are figuring out the differential for that, the next piece of information we need to know to figure out why that's happening is what is the peak pressure. Is it normal low or is it high? So a high peak pressure we'll call greater than 30. So if you have a low tidal volume alarm, the next thing you do is you're like, okay, let me look at the peak pressure. Is it low or is it high? So let's say we're in a situation when we're low tidal volume alarms going off and our peak pressure is low. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that we're putting the air in, but then it's leaking out somewhere. 
So one possibility is we're putting the air in and it's leaking out around the tube. Maybe there's a hole in the pilot balloon. Maybe the patient just woke up and bit through it. Um, there's a leak though. Around the tube is the most common one, but maybe somewhere in the circuit, some kind of leak is happening. So the air goes in and goes right out again, which is why both your tidal volumes and your pressures are low. Now, it's also possible that the leak is in the lung itself, that maybe there's a big lung lack after a trauma. And in that case, let's say that there's a big pneumo. If it's the case that you have a big pneumothorax, but you have a chest tube in, this is the situation you're going to find, that your low tidal volume, because your tidal volume is going to be low because the air goes in and straight out again, but your pressure is also low because again, the air goes in and straight out. So a pneumothorax with a chest tube in place, you're going to get this. You're going to get a low tidal volume and a low pressure. So in the context of a low tidal volume plus a low peak pressure, your job is to find the air leak. You know, is it around the ET tube? Is there a hole in the circuit somewhere? Did you just put in a chest tube for a big lung lock? Find the air leak. What about if we have a pneumothorax, but we haven't yet put in a chest tube? So all that air is, yes, leaking out of the lung, so it's not, you know, going into the lung because it's going right out again, but it's not leaving the chest wall. All that air is, in fact, building up in the chest. In this case, you know, our tidal volume is going to be low, but actually our pressure is not. Our pressure is going to be high. Now, this is where we get to the differential diagnosis for a high peak pressure. But we need more information. So if there is a high peak pressure, we have to do something else. We have to check a plateau pressure because that's the only way that we're going to figure out what's happening. So that's where we get to high peak pressure alarms. So high peak pressure alarms. As we said, a high peak pressure alarm is going to alarm at like 30 or above usually. Again, when we have a high peak pressure alarm, we're going to break it down with a differential diagnosis. And in this case, the way we're going to break it down, we have a high peak pressure, we got to check a plateau pressure. Because a high peak pressure alarm means something very different if it's accompanied by a low versus a high plateau pressure. Now, why do we care about this? Why are we bothering to get one extra number? We already have volumes and pressures, and like, can we just stick with one pressure? It's actually really helpful. Why? What does a plateau pressure help you figure out? What does that even mean? Let's go back for a moment to pulmonary physiology and to resistance and compliance. So let's say you're the one trying to blow up this ball and you're trying really hard to blow it up and you're having a hard time. It's taking a lot of pressure for you to get air into this ball, but you don't know why. You can't see. You don't know Am I having a hard time blowing this up because I'm dealing with a little coffee straw? Or am I having a hard time blowing this up because I'm dealing with basketball blocks? And if you're just sitting there just trying to blow it up and encountering that high pressure, you don't know why. You don't know if you're dealing with a resistance problem or a compliance problem. Fortunately, there is a button you can press on the ventilator where you can be like, help please, I am trying to figure this out. That button is called the inspiratory hold button. Every ventilator has one. Find it somewhere. But this is the button where you are requesting that the vent please help you figure out the pulmonary physiology. So what do you get by pressing this button? So you press your inspiratory hold button and you're going to get a graph that looks something like this. And then it'll give you a number. That's the plateau pressure. And plateau pressures, again, high plateau pressure, you're talking about 30. 30 is high limit-ish. So what does this mean? Like, why is this useful? Here's what this tells you. This graph, the plateau pressure, tells you how much pressure it takes to blow up your ball. Is it a normal amount of pressure, 15, 20, 25? Or does it take a lot of pressure to blow up that ball? That is what your plateau pressure is telling you. Now, it does take some pressure just to get the air through the straw, right? So the pressure on top of however much it takes to blow up the ball, however much pressure you use on top of that, that tells you how much you took to just get the air to the ball through the straw. That's your peak pressure. So this is what normal lungs look like. When you have normal lungs, boba straw, beach ball lungs, that is what this should look like. But what if you don't have normal lungs? What if the pressure is high? Okay, what is that going to look like? Well, one possibility is this. One possibility is that you actually have some basketball lungs. 
and that what's happening is your pressure is high and your peak pressure alarm is going off because it's taking a ton of pressure to inflate that basketball. So what is happening here? Well, you have basketball lungs, but your straw is kind of fine. That's not a problem. What's the differential diagnosis for this? The differential diagnosis for basketball lungs? Things that decrease lung compliance. Could be ARDS, could be pulmonary fibrosis, things that decrease lung compliance. That is what's going to give you basketball lungs, and that's what's going to give you this pattern on the ventilator. Now, what about this other pattern? What if you have nice, normal basketball lungs, but this time your pressure is high, but it's not the pressure that it takes to blow up the ball that's high. That's actually fine. So it's not that plateau pressure that's high. The peak pressure is high, but the plateau pressure is normal. What is that telling you? That is telling you that you have a straw problem. Because once the air gets to the ball, it's just as easy to blow up as it should be. The problem is getting the air to the ball through the straw. That is what that is telling you. Now, what is the differential for something that looks like this? So the differential diagnosis for lungs that look like this, beach ball lungs with a little coffee straw, what is that? The differential diagnosis for that are things like asthma and COPD, obstructive lung diseases, right? Now, that's one possibility, but there's another possibility, because remember, the patient's intubated. So another possibility that lungs will give you that appearance, where you have, you know, nice compliant beach ball lungs, but a really high peak pressure because of the straw problem, it's also possible there's some kind of obstruction in the tube. So, Overall, what is this telling you? If you have a high peak pressure alarm going off, you press your inspiratory hold button, you're gonna get two possibilities. If your peak pressure is high, but your plateau pressure, the pressure it takes to blow up the ball is actually low or normal, that's telling you you have a straw problem. You have an elevated airway resistance problem, either due to obstructive lung disease like asthma and COPD, or maybe because you have an obstruction in the tube. If on the other hand, you do an inspiratory hold, you discover that actually your plateau pressure is high, that the straw is not the problem, that it takes a lot of pressure to actually blow up that ball, that, the high plateau pressure, that is telling you that you have a decreased lung compliance problem. So maybe you have ARDS, maybe you have pulmonary fibrosis, or maybe you have a pneumothorax and all that air is getting into the chest and causing an increased buildup of pressure. That is what high peak pressure alarms tell you, knowing the plateau pressure low versus high. So hopefully, now you can see that vent alarms are actually not the vent being angry at you. Vent alarms are actually being helpful and friendly. It's just misunderstood. Vent alarms you're going to divide up into the two important ones, your tidal volume being low or your peak pressure being high. For a low tidal volume alarm, your differential diagnosis is based on whether your peak pressure is low or high. If you have a low peak pressure, go hunting for that air leak. It's somewhere. Go find it. If you have a low tidal volume but a high peak pressure, the next step to figure what's going on is checking your plateau pressure. So now we go to high peak pressure. If we have a high peak pressure alarm, you're going to check your plateau pressure because the differential diagnosis for a high peak pressure alarm with a low plateau pressure versus a high is very different. If you have a high peak pressure, but a low plateau pressure, you're saying that I have beach ball lungs, but I actually have a basketball or I actually have a, a, a coffee straw that's responsible for that high pressure. That is telling you that you have increased airway resistance. That is your problem. If you have a high plateau pressure, that is telling you that you have decreased lung compliance. So hopefully that was helpful in terms of you making friends with the vent and understanding that it is mostly trying to be helpful, not annoying.